Olá, bem-vindas e bem-vindos. Eu sou a Mariana Almeida e este é o McKinsey Talks, direto do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. Neste novo episódio da série sobre inteligência artificial nos negócios, vamos conversar sobre o que todo mundo está falando sem parar desde o começo deste ano, o chat GPT. Esse modelo de inteligência artificial capaz de responder perguntas complexas de forma criativa foi lançado no final de 2022, em apenas dois meses, superou 100 milhões de usuários e 13 milhões de visitantes diários. É o crescimento mais vertiginoso na história da internet para um aplicativo de grande público. Modelos de IA generativa devem catalisar a adoção da inteligência artificial nas tarefas cotidianas das empresas. Antes do chat GPT, a pesquisa The State of AI da McKinsey mostrava que a adoção de inteligência artificial mantinha-se razoavelmente estável desde 2018, em torno de 50%. Com potencial impacto cada vez mais claro na produtividade de diferentes setores, é bem provável que a adoção cresça fortemente nos próximos anos. Mas como contornar os muitos riscos éticos, legais e práticos envolvidos? No bate-papo de hoje, você vai conhecer quais são os casos concretos com potencial para o uso dessa tecnologia e quais medidas tomar para se proteger dos riscos. E para falar sobre este tema, está conectado conosco hoje o Michael Chui, sócio da McKinsey em São Francisco e líder do McKinsey Global Institute. Ele lidera as pesquisas sobre o impacto das tecnologias disruptivas e da inovação nos negócios, na economia e também na sociedade. Por isso, a nossa conversa hoje será em inglês. Hello, Michael. Welcome again. It's so nice to have you back here with us. Wonderful to be back. Thank you for inviting me. E também está aqui ao meu lado, no estúdio, o Pepe Caferata, sócio da McKinsey aqui em São Paulo e líder da Quantum Black na América Latina. A Quantum Black é uma empresa de analítica avançada adquirida pela McKinsey em 2015 e que auxilia empresas a usarem dados na sua tomada de decisões. Olá, Pepe, bem-vindo também. É um prazer tê-lo aqui de novo. Olá, Mari. Prazer é meu. Muito obrigado. Muito bem, sempre bem-vindo. So, let's get started. Michael, the first one goes to you. I think one of the most, uh, the most mesmerizing features about ChatGPT is its uh, apparent creativity. Would you explain how it works? Is it really creative, in fact? Well, I, I think it is a good question to ask how it works, and then we can discuss maybe the philosophical question about whether or not it's creative. Yeah. Uh, these are systems um, which we are sometimes described as based on foundation models. It's a type of machine learning in which really huge amounts of data are used in order to train the model. It could be everything that's you know po posted on the web. Uh, and so it's really gigantic amounts of training data. Um, that Those models are often actually... Um, improved uh, with these techniques called reinforcement learning with human feedback in, in order to, but what they're trained to do, which is interesting, mm -hmm. is they're basically trained to predict the next word. And so, you know, many people who use uh, an email system often find, you know, that you start typing something and it will predict uh, what you want to say. And you can say, yes, that's actually what you want to say. If you extend that capability, it turns out you can ask, you know, a, a system to provide an answer like Shakespeare would have written it or something like that. And so that's really what these systems do. They basically predict the next word and you get these remarkable results, partly because of the huge amounts of data that are there. So it's amazing. It gives a tremendous wow factor. I think the question that you ask is, does that mean that they're creative? Um, And that's a philosophical question. Um, you know, even people that we describe as creative, they're partly creative because they've read a lot of things or they've experienced a lot of the world. And so even as human beings who are creative, we do take in a lot of what um, what we've experienced in the world or read or watched or what have you. And so, you know, I think in some senses, it's creative if it feels creative. Um, but, you know, if you look behind the scenes, it really are these systems that are trained with huge amounts of data that are simply predicting the next word in a sequence. It's a matter of background here. So if a person has a background, it's supposed to be more creative because this person knows how to manage the information, right? Yeah. Yeah, Pepe, it's funny. Wanna... You know, creativity is based partly on our own experience. Yeah, yeah great. Pepe, do you want to add anything? I think it's a great question about the creativity, <laughs> right? And you can see the systems being used, as Michael was saying, to predict the next word. You can also see them to create paintings and arts. 
And it's a big debate, why right? artists and people that are, have a living or make a living based on writing very nice and artistic stuff or paintings, uh, it, it feels weird, right? So I think it's a very interesting debate to come. Um, I think there's a lot of concrete applications also in companies that we will talk about uh, during this chart um, that can be really interesting and, and help humans be better you know, and not compete, quote unquote, with them. Yeah, sure. So, Michael, uh, we have heard people saying that asking AI the right questions could be a very important skill in the future. Some are even saying that prompt engineering is the next uh, trendy profession. What do you think? And if you could explain a little bit the, the prompt engineering too, please. Yeah, many of these systems, um, the inputs to the systems are some sort of human language, uh, again, whether it's English or Portuguese or what have you. And then you get outputs, um, you know, from a large language model, you might get, uh, you know, paragraphs, uh, as Pepe was making reference to, you might get images if uh, you ask some of these systems. But what it does suggest is, you know, being able to give the right prompt, being able to use the right words as inputs can get you closer to the types of outputs that you want. And so this idea of prompt engineering, engineering the inputs that you give to these systems in order to get what you want, it will become an important skill. And people have even said, you know, will a job emerge for people who do this really well? Um, that could happen, uh, but I, I would point out a couple of things. Um, even if you look at the work that we all do, not even work, when we use a web search engine, over time, we've learned to do our own prompt engineering to figure out what works well. And so I think it will, in some cases, be a basic skill. The other thing that's interesting, that of course, is the people who are designing these systems or creating these systems or training these systems, I should be more precise, they would like it that... Uh, you don't actually have to have very specialized skills and knowledge. And so for both of those reasons, I think, um, uh, you know, it's going to be both an evolution of, of users who will learn more about how to give good prompts, as well as the technology, which increasingly will, um, uh, there are lots of incentives to evolve the technology. So you don't need specialized skills in order to get really good results. Okay, so Pepe, what are the cool things people are already doing with this technology? And what are some of the most promised using cases? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of amazing applications of this, of this technology. And there's several areas, right? One is in the area of marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. So through these technologies, you can create very personalized content. You can create new ways of um, doing the graphics and the text in the way that is very accurate for certain clusters or certain segments. And you can do it in a very fast way, right? Um, you can use it in operations as well, where the chatbots that we have today can be significantly improved to be able to really understand what they're asking them and give you much better answers uh, that can be more customer friendly and customer oriented, right? Um, in operations, it can help uh, employees in the plant ask very difficult questions about certain processes and it can give you very sophisticated answers. Same things in terms of sales forces when they're asking about products or the, you want to understand different options or different functionalities of very complex things. These uh, types of technologies can help you get very good answers for that, right? In the legal area, you can mine immense amount of documents looking for insights. You can um, look at um, different ways of interpreting different uh, contracts in very complex ways. Um, in medicine, in health, you can even also uh, look for new compounds in a much efficient way, you know, in a very creative way, in ways that no one has think, thought about. So the uses are endless. And I think the, the most concrete things, and Michael will talk about this later, is of all these amazing cool things I can do, which are the ones that are really going to drive value and how do I do something that is really um, something that it's contained, is controllable at this point in time while these technologies are emerging, but still can make a big difference in the life of, of many people. Okay, great, great opportunities ahead. But Michael, your articles emphasize that this is a time to be cautious too. Why is that? Uh, to be clear, uh, what I think it's important to do is to understand risks and be able to manage them. Uh, but there are some uh, risks you know, using these technologies, some of which are quite common or in common with other types of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies, and some that really have come to the fore. 
uh, one that comes to the fore um, is, and is quite prominent is the fact, you know, those of us in the field call it, they sometimes hallucinate. Uh, they create, um, they, they appear to be describing things very confidently, and yet they get the facts wrong. Um, someone actually had a system um, uh, create a biography of me and said, I, I graduated from Harvard and went to MIT for graduate school and co-authored a certain book. Um, all of those things are not true. Um, and so that's one of the challenges that that really exists, just whether or not the outputs from these uh, models are actually accurate. But there are other challenges too, which are in common with other AI systems. Again, they're trained based on a set of training data. If those types of training data have biases in them, um, many times these the outputs of these systems will also have the same type of bias. If you ask someone, you know, to dis if you ask one of these systems to describe a doctor, and a lot of doctors in the training corpus are male, it might just assume that again a doctor is male. And so a lot of those types of biases um, can occur. And then there are all kinds of questions about intellectual property too. Um, sometimes. Again, are, are the outputs of these systems in, you know, quote unquote, plagiarization of some of their training data? And those are some of the questions that are also out there. So where did you go to school finally? <laughs> I went to undergraduate at Stanford and I went to graduate school at Indiana University, both in the United States. <laughs> OK. And so, Michael, what measures can companies take to mitigate this risk that you just mentioned? Well, the number one thing is is actually understanding what those risks are. Again, if you take a risk management framework, you know the number one thing is try to create a comprehensive view of what those risks are, and then be able to manage each one uh, individually and collectively. Um, there are some things that you can. First of all, for any one of these risks, it's usually a combination of uh, multiple disciplines that have to address it. Whether it's technical disciplines, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, the legal profession, they're num usually, you know, you have to create these cross-functional teams to manage risks, just as you need cross-functional teams in order to capture the value. Um, but then for specific uh, risks, there are, you know, very specific things you can do. So for instance, on the technical side, if the use case that you're trying to implement is um, well well understood, um, then you might actually try to constrain the actions of that system, train it and put constraints on the system so that it only responds to those sorts of uh, to, to questions uh, within a defined domain. Something else you can do in terms of you know the the bias questions are test the system uh, for bias and continue to monitor its performance. Those are some of the things that uh, one can do. You want to add anything, Pat, on that? I think having the experts and the domain expert, as Michael was saying, in that cross-functional team with all the disciplines required is really important to make sure that whatever is coming from the models makes sense from a business perspective, makes sense from a customer perspective, and um, you know, complementing that with the legal, with the technical, with the compliance um, disciplines, I think is quite valuable. But having that domain expertise in marketing, in operations, in health, pharmaceuticals, whatever it might be, it's hugely important as well. So it's the human aspect, so someone Absolutely. always looking at. Mm -hmm. Marianne, if, if I could add, right? Sure, I mean, sure. I think at the, the current state of the art uh, for many of these systems, the perhaps in many cases, the best use of these systems is to create a first draft or several first drafts and still have a human in the loop. And so you do the prompt engineering, you get something back, but maybe not just send that out to the world, send it to a customer or send it without someone looking at it. And that's where you can often see some acceleration. That's certainly happening because these systems can also be used to help write computer code. The programmer doesn't disappear, but they get a draft of the code that they want, and then they can you know, look at it, test it, uh, refine it. So it gives you really what somebody wants. So it can save time and someone can just edit and uh, finalize it to make it good. Exactly. And Michael, let's assume that I have a company and I have a selected promising use case. What are the next steps if I want to just start with this technology? Yeah, first of all, hopefully you've chosen this use case in a in a business value back fashion. And one of the things that implies is you have a good understanding of the value you're going to get from that use case, whether it's accelerating productivity, whether it's, you know, being able to, you know, increase the conversion rate on uplift or cross sell or, or what have you, just get very clear on that. Um, and then be able to bring, again, uh, just as we had in risk uh, and capturing opportunity, make sure you bring the right set of people to bear. Because 
you know, for any use case, um, you're going to have a set of technical issues, but you're also going to make sure that your processes, your people, uh, also, you know, all of those things are 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 put in place. On the technical side, it is really important to make sure that you have the right, you know, machine learning and AI infrastructure. You know, so data pipelines, all the things that we need in general for this technology to to work well. Um, and you do have a set of design choices that you have to make about buy versus build and where you want to deploy and how much modeling and how much fine tuning you want to do. All those things are true on the technical side. But for all of us who have spent time implementing uh, technology within an organization, oftentimes there is even more effort uh, in making sure your organization is prepared and able to take advantage uh, of these systems. And so don't ignore the, that you know, people and organization work too. Unfortunately, we are reaching the end of our session. So would you two have any final remarks? If you want to start, Pepe, please. Well, I think the opportunities this kind of technology is open is huge. Um, and I think it's going to evolve over time, right? And so far, what we need to do, as Michael was saying, is get a very clear case where we have significant value and going step by step making sure we bring together all the people and all the disciplines that we need to make sure that this gets the results you want and gets adopted, right? Which I think is quite important. And finally, this is, again, enable humans to make better, to have a better job, to have a better outcome. It's not about uh, replacing man with machine, it's where the junction of man plus machine uh, really can drive significant value. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah. And Michael, how about you? You know, I, these these systems have a you know great wow factor as I describe it, and um, you know that's that's fun. I love that, um, but at the same time, I guess I'll just echo Pepe. You know, when we're going to bring them to business, let's let's figure out what the business value we want to create is, and then just be disciplined about trying to capture it in the same as we would for any other technology. So, Michael and Pepe, thank you very much for joining us today, and I admit that I feel much more enlightened about this new trend now. So great, thank you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Muito obrigada também a você que nos acompanha em vídeo ou em podcast. Para entrar em contato com os nossos especialistas ou enviar perguntas, o nosso e-mail é mckinsey-talks.com E a nossa agenda completa está no mckinsey-talks.com Lá você também pode conferir este episódio e os anteriores em vídeo ou em podcast. E se você gosta do McKinsey Talks, compartilhe este episódio com seus amigos e colegas. É isso aí. Muito obrigada e até a próxima! Música